Hello, everybody. My name is Clara. Thank you for the introduction. I am the director of research at Kaiko. Kaiko is a crypto data provider, so today I'm going to be using a bunch of charts to help understand market trends since the aftermath of the FTX collapse, which was perhaps one of the most significant market events to ever happen in the cryptocurrency industry. But first, before I get started, just a little bit about Kaiko, who we are. Kaiko is a crypto data provider. We've actually been around since 2014. Today, we have four main business units. The first is our market data. We collect data from more than 100, both centralized and decentralized exchanges, which is tick level and aggregated data. We also offer BMR compliant rates and indices. Uh, this is really good for pricing, for uh, high quality, clean prices for a crypto asset. We offer quantitative analytics. This is stuff like value at risk and implied volatility, really great for risk management. And then finally, research. This is the department that I lead. And so today, I'll be showing you a bunch of cool data-driven charts using Kaiko's data. So I think the past few months, more than ever, has shown how important data is for uh, understanding crypto markets. Without high quality data, it's simply impossible to understand the core trends driving the current behavior that we're seeing. So today I'm going to focus actually not just on FTX, but all the events that have happened since, specifically starting in 2023, we're seeing a lot of market volatility. So the three major market events that are continuing to impact crypto are first, the FTX collapse. This was the collapse of one of the largest exchanges in the industry, and essentially it brought down a bunch of other important market participants. For example, Genesis, which was one of the largest crypto lenders, had to file for bankruptcy. So essentially the FTX collapse had an enormous impact on the entire industry in what we see today. The second trend is the regulatory crackdown. That actually first started in about January of 2023, um, especially in the United States. We had a many notable enforcement actions. It started with Paxos, which was forced to halt the issuance of the BUSD stablecoin, which was used widely on Binance. Kraken was also forced to halt their staking service for Ethereum. And just last week, you had Binance sued by the CFTC, um, and then Coinbase was served a Wells notice by the SEC. So regulation is essentially top of mind, especially in the United States right now. But third is the banking crisis. The banking crisis has had an enormous impact specifically on USD payment rails. The collapse of both Signature and Silvergate, which had very widely used payment networks used by hundreds of market makers, traders, institutions, and exchanges, essentially providing seamless 24-7 USD payment transfers. These no longer exist. So you have a big scramble in the industry right now to try and find banking partners and USD payment rails. So all three of these events have essentially upended crypto market structure. So I'm going to talk a bit about some trends that we're seeing in the data. So I think one of the best charts and data types to understand general engagement in crypto markets is trade volume. Here I'm showing aggregated trade volume across the most liquid centralized exchanges. You have FTX also highlighted. They stopped trading in November. Um, but we're seeing a pretty interesting trend, especially over the past year. In 2022, you saw trade volume really dip. In December, it hit multi-year lows in the aftermath of the FTX collapse. I think it was sort of a slow, steady downwards trend, starting with the Terra Luna collapse. But something interesting happened at the start of January 2023. You actually had a surge in trade volume, and today trade volumes are at pre-FTX levels. So what's going on? It's actually perfectly correlated to what we're seeing in cryptocurrency markets, which is a general bull rally. And it's, um, it's quite amazing to see Bitcoin at trade at 10-month highs, especially considering all of the volatile market events that have emerged just in the past few months. And I think the reason why we're seeing this big surge in trade volume and general increase in crypto market prices is that there's this powerful narrative that has emerged in the aftermath of the banking crisis in particular. It's sort of like this is what crypto has been made of all along. This is Bitcoin's shining moment to prove why even the banking sector you can't trust. And so I would say whatever you think of narratives and what, whatever you think of crypto, it's ultimately what the investors believe. And investors are believing in this powerful narrative. But there's more to that, and I'll actually get to that a bit, that it also has to do with liquidity. But the next trend I want to look at is market share. So I generated this chart about 10 days ago, and a lot has changed since then. Specifically with Binance, last week, two major market events hit the exchange. The first is Binance halted their zero-fee trading program. 
Back in July, they launched zero fee trading for about 13 Bitcoin trading pairs. This caused their market share to increase almost 20% over the past eight months relative to their biggest competitors. Um, and you can see this trend emerging. It's been steady, but back in July, it really kicked off, um, and specifically versus its competitors like Coinbase. Um, however, once they paused this program, you saw an instant drop of market share of 10%. So this is not shown in the chart because this data is about 10 days old. Another huge market event that happened was last week, the CFTC sued Binance. Um, and so you also saw the big drop in market share there. I don't think that these two trends are a coincidence. I think Binance was aware of what was about to happen and they halted their zero fee trading program simply because it was diverting a bunch of potential revenue. They essentially for 60% of total trade volume were not earning revenues. Um, and so now we see essentially I think going forward, it's gonna be very interesting to map Binance's market share, especially because today they still have about 60% of total trade volume across all cryptocurrency exchanges. And I think also with the collapse of the three banks in the United States, we're gonna see a shift towards offshore trading platforms, simply because it's a lot harder to form banking relationships in the United States. And here's one of my favorite charts. This is actually looking at a different side to liquidity. So trade volume is just one half of the story when you're talking about liquidity in cryptocurrency markets. You also want to have a deep understanding of the underlying order books. So one of the, I would say, most comprehensive data types that Kaiko offers is aggregated market depth. Essentially what we do is we take the total quantity of bids and asks across all exchanges that offer Bitcoin trading. Um, and here we get this measure for market depth. So the higher the market depth, the more liquid the cryptocurrency. And we can see a pretty stark trend in this chart. Since the FTX collapse, the quantity of orders on Bitcoin order books has more than halved. I would say in October, we had about 12,000 Bitcoin sitting on these order books. And today, it's just about 6,000 Bitcoin. Not only that, the drop in liquidity has been exacerbated by the collapse of Silvergate and Signature. This is because market makers now have a lot more difficulty with accessing cryptocurrency markets, specifically on centralized exchanges. So I would say this is one of the most pressing, um, this is one of the most pressing trends hitting the industry right now. It's this general drop in market liquidity. And it's actually making markets more volatile, both towards the upside and towards the downside. So I mentioned narratives a bit ago to show how narratives are extremely powerful in cryptocurrency markets, but it's narratives combined with this illiquidity, which is essentially creating a lot of upwards price momentum right now. So now on to a slightly different trend, and this is more related to what we're seeing in the banking sector, which is the elimination of USD payment rails. So here I have a chart showing the market share of trade volume for all trades denominated in either stable coins, fiat currencies, or other, which is almost always Bitcoin or ETH. We can see that about 10 days ago when I made this chart, nearly 80% of all trade volume was denominated in stable coins. This is up nearly 20% since the start of 2022. So this just shows that stable coins are becoming increasingly important in the entire cryptocurrency markets. And we can probably see this trend increasing over time, especially as it becomes more difficult to access US dollar payment networks connecting exchanges. Tether in particular, when you actually break down the market share of stable coins, Tether accounts for 80% of the total stable coin market on centralized exchanges. So I think in general, we're seeing a bit of a risk off from US dollar. Here I show the market share of volume, but specifically looking at the fiat currencies. This is everything including the dollar, the Korean currency, Euro, TRY, that's the Turkish Lira. Um, and we can see also an interesting trend that the US dollar has been become a bit less used on centralized cryptocurrency exchanges since the start of 2022. Today it accounts for about half of all trade volume that is denominated in a fiat currency. You'll also notice an interesting trend that is the Korean won. Korean markets are extremely active in the cryptocurrency space, so that's why you see a significant market share here. Um, Euro today accounts for just 10% of total fiat volume. Um, however, I think there's actually a pretty big opportunity in Europe and APAC simply because the US is becoming increasingly unfriendly. So we're gonna pay close attention to the market share of Euro trade volume over the next few months. So those were 
some charts to showcase how important data is to understand what actually is going on in cryptocurrency markets. But I would say, because we're at a more institutional conference, data is also extremely important for your internal business practices and specifically for risk management. So now I'm gonna talk a bit about the kinds of data and information you can use to manage risk, especially if you are trading crypto, you're managing crypto assets on behalf of your clients, or engaging in any aspect of the crypto industry that touches cryptocurrencies. So all of the charts I made and showed you, they were using liquidity metrics. So liquidity metrics can be everything from trade volume to market depth, you have the bid-ask spread, you can use price slippage. So this is all collected from centralized exchanges, and this data is extremely important for understanding a question such as, if there is a black swan event, can I efficiently liquidate the assets that I hold for my clients? This is what many investors did not do before the FTX collapse. In fact, many cryptocurrencies that were held on these exchanges and invested in by Alameda or FTX were extremely illiquid. If you had paid attention to order books for these cryptocurrencies, you would understand that market depth was extremely low, especially for altcoins. So that's why liquidity data, especially from centralized exchanges, is absolutely crucial, especially if you are investing in these markets. Decentralized exchanges too, the data is similar, but a little bit different. Um, so you have data uh, collected directly on chain from liquidity pools. So this includes metrics such as liquidity events, which in this case are called mints or burns. You have liquidity pool snapshots, which can also be known as total value locked. And then you have swap volume. So DEXs are actually becoming increasingly important in the crypto industry. So I'd recommend using liquidity metrics from both centralized and decentralized exchanges. But let's pull in a bit of traditional finance. I think many crypto investors are relatively new to the financial industry as a whole, so might be unfamiliar with some more traditional metrics, but the good news is Keiko actually has a lot of these metrics, such as value at risk and expected short shortfall. We also have metrics such as implied volatility. This stuff is part of a toolkit that any asset manager uses in traditional finance, um, but should be applied to cryptocurrency markets too. It's really designed to help investors manage risk and their P&L. But data is just one side of the story. One of the questions everyone has in the aftermath of the FTX collapse is, how can I trust the centralized platforms that I use? So Keiko and many data providers build exchange rankings. We do this for a few reasons, but most important is because we need to pick data sources for our reference rates and indices. We can't just use every single exchange, so we need to only use a subset of reliable price venues. However, I'm showing this slide here specifically because it's also an imperfect ranking, specifically what happened last week with Binance in their lawsuit against the CFTC. This is an imperfect ranking and there are limits to every exchange ranking, even though it is important to have one. So that's why we use about 25 different metrics to rank these exchanges based on governance, business, liquidity, security, technology, and data quality. But even when you have all this information, sometimes it's not enough, especially when you're going back in time. I think a lot of the CFTC's allegations are from 2020 and this, is, this exchange ranking was made a few months ago. So it's very hard to have a historical understanding of everything that's happened on an exchange. That's why I think one of the most, uh, I would say, important metrics for understanding reliability of centralized platforms is what's called proof of reserves. After the FTX collapse, which essentially resulted from a complete mismatch in the amount of reserves that they were holding on behalf of their clients, there was no transparency at all. There's this big movement to have proof of reserves. Um, here is actually Binance's proof of reserves, um, interestingly enough. Um, they've been one of the most transparent when it comes to publishing the wallet addresses that are holding their clients' assets. Um, and I think proof of reserves is something though that only works if you have an independent third party that is auditing this information. And that's actually a big pain point for the industry today. Many auditors do not want to work with exchanges categorically. So what we need first is to find auditors that are willing to certify proof of reserves and that's a challenge in and of itself. So what now? I've talked about the importance of data for first understanding market trends, but second for risk management. Here I have three predictions for 2023, specifically based on the data and trends that we're seeing. 
The first is I think there are many new regional opportunities in the industry, specifically in the Europe region and APAC. We're already seeing a lot of crypto companies are moving specifically to Paris. Last week you had both Coinbase and Circle announce their European headquarters in Paris. You're also seeing Hong Kong, surprisingly, become increasingly friendly to the entire crypto industry. So I think there's gonna be a big focus on new regional opportunities away from the United States, which is increasingly unfriendly right now. My second prediction is the power of DeFi. When you have all of these centralized exchanges, it's very hard, even with a ranking, even with proof of reserves, to trust centralized companies. So that's why DeFi, I think it's one of the best use cases in advertisements for DeFi, is DeFi is transparent, even though there are still many problems and hacks and all of those things, you can still always verify everything on chain, and that is the core power of blockchain technology. And then three is transparency wins. I do think centralized platforms are absolutely essential to actually onboarding people to the industry. You need to have some interaction to the traditional financial space in order to enter crypto markets. So in order for these companies to win the trust of their clients, the more transparency, the better. So these are my three predictions. If you are interested in more analysis, you can always subscribe to Kaiko's research newsletters. We have two a week and we have many different market reports. We have analyst calls, subscribe here. You can also uh, go to Kaiko's website at kaiko.com to learn more about us and also visit our booth. I'm here with three other colleagues, uh, so stop by and say hello. But thank you very much.